Here's the story. Mr. Barry Fulhart was admitted this morning at like 6.30 in the morning. Uh, he came in with heart failure. And the ER gave him 20 milligrams of Lasix. I don't think it's been very effective. He's had almost no urine output at all. Um, and then at 8.30 this morning, he went to atrial fibrillation. And initially, he was stable. His heart rate was 120s to 130s, but asymptomatic. I paged the team, and they said they would address that during rounds. But now the patient's got progressively more symptomatic. He's super short of breath, he's working really hard to breathe, his current vital signs are heart rate 130, blood pressure 98 over 46, respiratory rate of 36, and his oxygen saturation is 90% on non breather. I'm just really work worried about how hard he's working to breathe, uh, and I'm not sure what to do about it. Here's a cardiologist right now. through his kidneys as well, so Very it's good. not filtering. So he said because there's low cardiac output and the blood's not running to the kidneys as well, the kidneys can't respond to the elastics as effectively. Very good. And sometimes you need to increase the cardiac output to make the, the kidneys respond, and sometimes you just need more elastics. 20 milligrams is like the low dose. Full heart, he may need 60 milligrams or more. Um, so yeah, they gave Lasix. It hasn't helped this guy at all. That, that we know of. That she said she hasn't seen any urine output. Um, okay, so what other assessment findings would you anticipate to find with this heart failure patient? Yes? Possible low sound, increased low sound. Yes. So they could be decreased if they're too full, you just can't hear much at all diminished. Or what other noisy sounds might you hear? Crackles. Crackles, wheezes, and? 
rails, a ronca, yes. Something noisy, because you hear fluid in there. Um, we talked about his pedal edema. We talked about his worker breathing. Any other assessment findings you would anticipate? The CO2 could be up. How would we know that, though? What's your question? Yeah, his respirations were really high. When we talked about patients have low cardiac output, you'll see high respirations because they're having to work extra hard to get the oxygen in their system. Very good. The other thing you might see, and this nurse didn't mention it, they might have a change in mental status. If you have decreased cardiac output, blood isn't getting to the kidneys, and blood isn't getting north either. So sometimes their mental ability is a little different. He might have been like talkative and friendly in the morning, and now he's a little lethargic or even confused. That should be big red flag in your head. Cardiac output's dropping. Question in the back, Beatrice? I was going to say that. Oh, you are? Okay, my feet clicked. Um, yes, yeah, so lots of assessment findings with this patient. My last question is Is there anything this nurse could have done differently? The day shift nurse, they got report at 7 a.m. Yes? Well, she said she called the, the physician or the medicine team and didn't really like follow up on it, it seemed like. So if she is really concerned, and especially with those vital signs, like I don't know when that would trip the, the muse score or whatever, but she should really follow up on that. You're right, so what he said is she didn't really follow up. A lot of nurses say, well, I called the doctor. Got then. Oh no. If you call the doctor and you don't get a response for your patient that you're concerned about, call the person above them, call somebody else, call a different doctor, get your charge nurse to help you advocate for the patient. The other thing that concerned me is the ER nurse gave Lasix, by 10 o'clock, if I hadn't seen urine output, I'd be asking somebody, hey, can we get some more Lasix? Can we do something else? I hear crackles in his lungs. Look how much he's working already. We've got to get this stuff off. I can't just wait all day long. So my, my goal that I want you to take away from this is if you are a patient advocate. When you have heart failure patients, you're constantly thinking, trying to improve their cardiac output. This nurse, she did some things right, but I feel like she could have been a little more of an advocate. Good, good thoughts on that. Any other questions about this little scenario? <coughs> Would it be appropriate to ask the administrator? Draw function for the kidneys? Um, yes, that would come eventually. I think right now, because it's decompensating, they're not going to be thinking so much about getting those values. What they want to know right now is what's his doctor's saturation and how can we fix it? Because it's, it's low, right? So, yes, that, that will come. We'll talk about it in the next. Sodium retention and basal constriction. 
Oh shoot, so now we have, we're holding on to sodium, which means we also hold on to water, water and we're vasoconstricting. Double whammy for the heart. Body's trying to help, but it's really not helping. Um, this release activates the release of antidiuretic hormone. Now we don't want antidiuretic, we want diuretic. We want the, the juice to come out. So we're making it worse. And then the release of ADH causes the kidneys to reabsorb more water, so more fluid are bloated. The combination of increased sodium and water leads to further increased preload. The weak heart cannot handle the excess fluid or preload. Congestion kicks in and the heart becomes more dilated, hence cardiac output drops even more. It's not really stinks. The body's trying to help. So what can we do to stop this cycle? Think pharmacology. <clears throat> What's that? Meds. Which med is going to affect our renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system? Huh? ACE inhibitors. Yes. Very, very good. We'll talk about them more a little bit. All right. This is a little schematic that Gene actually made just to show the process with arrows, what happens with the kidneys and heart failure. All right. So types of heart failure. Your book breaks up into four parts. The thing is, they don't always exist separately. Very often they coexist. But I'm going to break them apart just so you can understand how the heart responds um, to the decreased credit output. All right. So the first two categories are systolic versus diastolic. Okay. So with systolic heart failure, systole is the squeeze. So the squeeze is not very good. Right? You don't have a very strong contraction, decreased contraction rate. That makes sense? Um, and then over here with diastolic heart failure, that's supposed to be when the heart's filling with enough blood that it needs to circulate to the body. But what if the heart muscle is stiff? Or what if the heart muscle has gotten too thick, there's not enough space for the blood to fill into it? Those two things are going to be your diastolic heart failure. But sometimes, I guess that these can coexist. So with systolic heart failure, um, the decreased amount of blood, there's a decreased amount of blood ejected from the ventricle. And you would think to yourself, man, look at all that space to fill the ventricle. We should be able to get a good amount of blood out. But because the muscle's so thin and weak, it's, it squeeze sucks. So it's supposed to be squeezing like this and into the heart. It's more like this, like a little quiver at the base. Very poor contractility. Question in the back? They can. That's a good question. If the kidneys aren't getting the oxygen that they need, they're not going to function. You can dump 500 milligrams of Lasix in them, but if they don't have oxygen, they're not going to be able to filter. A lot of these patients, because of the decreased cardiac output, end up going into renal failure as well. That is a, like a classic combo, is heart failure and renal failure, which is a really bad combo. You can imagine how closely we have to watch their eyes and nose for those patients, because they can't dump anything off. That's a good question. Did I repeat this question? You guys all hear it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, systolic heart failure. It is caused by impaired uh, contractile function, uh, very often from an ischemic heart attack, which you guys will talk about in the afternoon lecture. But if you just imagine the blood vessels that feed the heart are clogged off, you're supposed to get oxygen, and you don't, now the cells can't squeeze as effectively. That's, that's the story of that one. Um, Increased preload or too much fluid on board is going to stretch out that ventricle. And when it's stretched and dilated, remember band. <clears throat> when it's stretched and dilated, it's not going to be able to squeeze as well. Um, other issues that can cause that is <coughs> valve problems, valve disease. If, let's say, your uh, aortic valve is stenosed, then the blood that's supposed to be exiting the heart, going to systemic circulation, now is staying in there. Right? It's supposed to be coming out, but there's a tiny little hole that's supposed to fit through. So blood starts to back up and dilate that ventricle out. That is systolic heart failure. Um, this is just a little image to show you kind of how the progression goes. This is your healthy heart, the strong muscle to squeeze with. This one's getting a little bit thicker, and this one's completely dilated. And this is as a response to too much work for the heart. All right, diastolic heart failure is your next type. Diastolic heart failure is when the heart cannot fill or contract effectively due to increased resistance. Right. You can see this heart muscle here. All right. Any other time you work a muscle, you want it to get big, right? When I go to the gym and pump iron, as you guys can tell I do all the time, you 
work out and you want the muscle to get bigger. And that's good for every muscle except for the heart. You don't want a giant heart. They don't work as well. You want a nice, tight, small heart that can squeeze effectively every single time. When they get thickened like that, there's not enough space, and believe it or not, the muscle does not squeeze as well. It's a very narrow window for um, how healthy the muscle is supposed to be. And I'll tell you, the surgeons that I've talked to, the patients that they do these heart transplants on, they'll tell you the hearts are like this big. So if you imagine a heart that big inside your chest, where do your lungs go? Which is going to even worsen your cardiac output. All right. Um, so diastolic heart failure is caused by left ventricular hypertrophy from chronic hypertension. All right. So just like whenever I'm pumping iron, I'm pushing against resistance, right? That's exactly what the heart does. When you have high blood pressure, peripheral vascular disease, the heart's pushing against all that afterload, and it works so hard that it thickens itself up. It's trying to help, but it's not helping. It's making it worse. Um, Aortic stenosis we talked about, the blood vessel, or the valve is too narrow, it can't push against that. Uh, and then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, is just the diagnosis for that, whenever the, the muscle wall gets too thick. Yes, so would it be solid for the thinning effect and the diastolic is the thickening? Most often. Her question is with systolic, is it thin ventricle and diastolic thick ventricle? Yes. But also with diastolic, you can just have a stiff ventricle. So some patients' hearts um, <clears throat> get stiff because of other conditions. They get some sort of virus, sometimes even with um, pregnancy. There's a bunch of other random things that can happen. But thick ventricles, again, will cause the um, diastolic heart failure. Okay. I love this next picture. All right, this is a great picture of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you imagine this is the heart turned this way, sliced in half, and you're looking up at it from the apex. So this is where the blood, this is where the blood's supposed to go. That's not much space, right? To circulate for the whole body. Look how thick that muscle is. You can see how that causes some problems with cardiac output. All right, the next type of heart failure is left versus right. And again, we're going to separate them, but very often they go hand in hand. Someone gets left heart failure, and very soon now their right heart's failing too. All right. Do you, the way to remember left versus right is what is feeding that side of the heart. So with the left side of the heart, where's the blood coming from? <laughs> the lungs. So the lungs are supposed to be pouring oxygenated blood into the left atrium and then to the left ventricle. But if the blood is not being squeezed out effectively or offloaded, where's the blood going to back up to? The fluid. Back into the lungs. So left heart failure patients have respiratory issues from, from fluid overload. And then for right heart failure, what feeds the right heart? Your, your peripheral systemic circulation. So if blood's coming in here and that right heart can't offload, can't get the blood up into the lungs, it starts backing up. And then you have your systemic symptoms. All right, so left side of heart failure. This is the most common type of heart failure. Like I said, the fluid um, backside reaches the pulmonary bed, causing pulmonary edema. The symptoms of left side of heart failure are increased capillary refill, orthopnea, dyspnea on exertion. You guys saw that with Mr. Full Heart. Nocturnal dyspnea? Why would that be? Why is it worse at nighttime? If you're laying down and all that fluid just collects. And you're, oh man, a classic question you'll ask your patients in heart failure is how many pillows do you sleep with at night? A lot of times patients come in, they're like, oh, I got no medical history, but they're huffing and puffing and you see the pedal edema. I usually say, well, how many pillows do you sleep with at night? They're like, well, actually I sleep in the lazy boy. I have a hard time laying flat. They probably had heart failure for years with no diagnosis. So how many pillows is a good question. Um, they have a cough with frothy sputum. This is indicative of pulmonary edema. My question here is, why is it frothy? Because, you know, when someone has pneumonia, they have like the thick, tenacious secretions, mucusy. All right. And that's from infection. That's your body's response to infection. When your body just has fluid overload, it's just that fluid 
and the air moving through is going to froth it up like cappuccino. Um, and you'll see those patients, whenever they go into pulmonary edema, you drop that breathing tube in, you'll see like frothy stuff all in the tube, you have to suction all that out. So alpha is pink and frothy because the capillary beds are so overstretched from high blood pressure, they leak a little bit of blood into it. So pink, frothy sputum. If you ever see that on your patient, you should be very concerned about pulmonary edema. Tachypnea, we've talked about this ad nauseum. The patient breathes faster because they need to get more breaths in a minute to oxidate their body because their heart isn't doing a good job of pumping the blood out. Diaphoresis um, is a symptom of low oxygen and low cardiac output, which kind of go hand in hand. What is diaphoresis? Sweating. 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 It's not like that. I'm so hot, I've been running all day. Diaphoresis gets just sitting there, cold, clammy sweat. It's a little scarier. Um, basal crackles are long eye because of the fluid that you hear sloshing around in there. Cyanosis from the hypoxia they're experiencing. There's so much fluid in the lungs, they're not exchanging the gases. They'll see cyanosis at their fingertips first and their lips. You should be concerned. Um, hypoxia, which you would see on your ABG. And elevated pulmonary artery pressures, which you won't know unless you drop a swan against catheter, which we'll talk about. Um, let's see. The audible S3 and S4. You guys learned about that in your assessment <coughs> lecture. <coughs> so the S3 that you would hear is whenever the ventricles are filling with too much fluid, it's like the sloshing around that you would hear. And the S4 is whenever the blood is having to be pushed in too hard against the stiff ventricular wall. It's very hard to discern the difference. Um, but if you work in a cardiac unit, you'll get to where you can. But initially, all you hear is that extra sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the question is to repeat. So S3 is the rapid filling of the ventricles, the sloshing against that baggy ventricle, and the S4 is the sound of the blood being forced into a stiff ventricle. All right. The next one is nocturia. Why do they pee more nighttime? Left side of heart failure. Simple answer is because they can't breathe in the middle of the night, the fluid starts collecting in their lungs. They wake up and realize, oh, I gotta pee. That's the short of it. So you ask your patient in your assessment, how many pills do you sleep with at night? Do you find that you have to go to the bathroom frequently at night? Those should be indicators that the patient has heart failure. Um, waking, fatigue, weakness, lethargy, might be a murmur, which could have been cause of this whole thing in the first place. Um, you'll see a large left ventricle on your x-ray, um, and large left atrium, narrowing pulse pressure. What is that, a narrowed pulse pressure? <coughs> Very good. He said when the systolic and diastolic get closer together. So usually say you have a systolic of 120 and a diastolic of 80. And then you get a systolic of 110 and a diastolic of 90. And a systolic of 100 and a diastolic of 95. So as that narrows, that's a narrowed pulse pressure. That's indicative of lots of things, especially neuro-related, but also of heart failure. And the reason why is, usually you have systolic 110, diastolic 80, right? What if you have systolic 110, see there's not much of a difference there? Usually you have a squeeze, which makes your systolic so much higher and the diastolic is relaxed. But if there's not much difference between the two, you're gonna have a narrowed pulse pressure. Uh, and you will see that with your heart failure patients. You're like, that's a weird blood pressure. That can't be right. It's left side of heart failure. It might be accurate, actually, because their heart's not squeezing very well, and the difference between the two is very little. All right. Left side of heart failure often causes pulmonary edema. And pulmonary edema is a medical emergency. <clears throat> so pulmonary edema is the accumulation of fluid in the interstitial tissue and alveoli of the lungs. So your patient's literally drowning in their own fluid that's back up into their heart. How is they drowning is an emergency, right? So you should treat pulmonary edema the same way. The rapid interventions um, are necessary or your patient will die. They will drown right in front of you. Their stats will drop, they'll stop breathing, they'll pass out, they'll be gone. And I've seen it, and it's very scary to watch someone drown from pulmonary edema. You gotta, you gotta step in there and work quickly. Alright, so how do you treat pulmonary edema? Number one is diuretics. We gotta get that fluid pulled off. So we're gonna give a big bolus of Lasix or Bumex or some other diuretic pull the fluid off. 
Um, I've even seen them dialyze patients. So patients can't get their kidneys to pull the fluid off, send them dialysis emergently, and pull the fluid off ourselves. Um, nitrates. So we'll talk about nitrates when we get to meds, but nitrates are going to vasodilate and reduce the systemic vascular resistance. So I want to be clear with this one. So we'll talk about nitrates this afternoon. We know <laughs> nitrates are going to vasodilate. We a lot of times hear that you give nitroglycerin for chest pain. That is true. But in this patient, we're not giving it for chest pain. We're giving it for the vasodilation effect. We want to make it easier for the heart to offload the ventricles. Because right now, it's not doing a good job. Fluid's backing up. If we can make it a little bit easier for the heart, dial up those vessels, and decrease the, which one? Afterload. Decrease the afterload, then hopefully we can get the heart to offload the fluid and the <coughs> lungs won't be so backed up. Who would give us morphine? Why would we give morphine to a patient in pulmonary edema? So one thing is they get really anxious. If you were drowning, wouldn't you be a little anxious? So it kind of helps calm them a little bit. And remember, there's a nice little side effect of morphine, which is vasodilation. So now we're given um, diuretics to pull the fluid off. We're going to give a nitrate to vasodilate, a little touch of morphine to vasodilate, and hopefully we can get the patient to cure their own pulmonary edema. Why would I need to be cautious with giving morphine to a patient in respiratory stress? Yes. Because it reduces your respiratory rate? He said because it's going to reduce your respiratory rate, and that's exactly right. We need every one of those breaths. I know he's breathing fast. He's supposed to be breathing fast. That's his body's way of compensating. We don't need him to slow down his respirations. So we're not going to give a big, like, giant dose, like a pain medication. Just a little touch. Just to vasodilate, calm down a little bit. We're not trying to, like, cure his back pain or something like that. Okay, that's a good... Good response there. All right. So as you guys can guess, Mr. Fullhart had what condition? He was going into pulmonary edema. Yes. Which is why he had crackles, why he's so short of breath, why even at 100% he's only statting at 90. He's got so much fluid he can't exchange the gases. So I want everyone just to take a moment and imagine what Mr. Fullhart might have looked like. You have a stat nurse, you just show up on the scene. What do you think he would look like? Just imagine him in your head. Hmm? He might be a little cyanotic. Yeah. Diaphoretic. He's probably going to be diaphoretic, yes. Yeah. He's gonna, probably sitting up, not laying down, sitting up, like lethargic, working very, very hard. And here's the thing a lot of people come from they say, oh, well, his stats are going percent he doesn't say eight as the first number, so I feel okay about it. Oh no, you as the nurse know this is scary. I responded to a squat maybe a month ago, and I showed up on scene, and Mr. Fulmer was essentially what I saw. He was laying in the bed, lethargic, breathing probably like 40 times a minute, cool, clammy, not, not very responsive at all. And I said to the nurse, you know, how is this guy usually? She's like, well, yesterday he was up and talking to us. We're actually planning on discharging him today. Yeah. So I knew we had to intubate this patient because look how much he's working to breathe. Yes, it says 90 on the pulse oximeter, yes, but I just thought the number of breathing on him, he hasn't come up at all. So I knew we need rapid intervention. So I called the ICU doctor. I said, get down here, bring your intubation supplies. We're intubating this guy. He's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? I was like, I don't know. I just showed up, and he's cyanotic, he's diaphoretic, he's breathing 40 times a minute, he's lethargic, and he's usually awake, and he needs to intubate. So the doctor comes down, he's like, no, 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 look, he's 90%. I said, doctor, he is working for every bit of that 90%, and we're even giving him 100% oxygen, and he's still only 90%. I know the 90% looks good on the chart, but the patient I'm looking at needs rapid intervention. Blew me off, well, 30 minutes later, we intubated. I got all the supplies out, I set everything up, I drew up places, I was ready to go. But the doctor just wouldn't do it until it was too late. When the guy started like dropping a stash to the 70s, that's when he said, okay, listen to me. So you as a nurse have to be the patient advocate and pick up on these little signs. You know, the nurse, he called the SWAT because the patient was acting different. And that's a great reason to. You walk in, you're like, well, yesterday he was funny. And now he's like, not really doing too much. <laughs> well, probably because his cardiac output's really low and he's drowning. So, pulmonary edema is is a medical emergency. You need to act very, very quickly. All right. I like this little picture. Where did it go? Oh, sorry. Back up. Test the findings. We're going to talk about all of them. They'll have the 
It's possible to just have, I mean, it is possible to just have left or right side, because I think if you have left-sided heart failure and your blood's not getting to your body, then it's backing up in your lungs, and if it's backing up in your lungs, then it's, so I would think it would almost be, like, not possible to just have one-sided heart right. failure. So he makes a good point. He said, wouldn't it be not possible just to have one-sided heart failure? And the answer is most of the time, yes. Most of the time, if you have left-sided heart failure, blue backs up in the lungs. Then there's too much pressure in the lungs. So then the right heart starts to have issues too. But sometimes it starts with the right heart because of the lungs. So you go into right heart failure first and eventually it's, it's left. But it's, you don't know at what stage you're receiving this patient. They might have just gone into right heart failure in the past month and it hasn't progressed to left side. Or they just went to left heart failure because they had a heart attack and the right side's still okay for now if we get interventions going. Otherwise, it's going to back up on the right side too. That's a good question. Any other questions before I move to the next slide? Yes. So I know these symptoms should be pretty standard across the board, but it's like in the previous lecture, it was pointed out that women present differently with heart problems than men do. Mm -hmm. Would there be any significant differences in the symptoms that we would be seeing with these problems? Like maybe women present a little bit differently from men? Because you've given us lots of male examples, but you haven't mentioned anything about women. Okay. So I didn't know if there was a difference in the symptoms. Good question. With cardiac symptoms, I think you're referring to a myocardial infarction. The pain that they feel sometimes is much more diffuse in females. But heart failure is heart failure, whether it's men or women. You'll still see the edema both ways. You'll still see the shortness of breath in both ways. The difference might be how the patient describes it. When a, what a man describes as pulmonary edema, a female might describe as something else. She says, I just developed pinkles over the year. And the man's like, I don't know. My legs are just thicker than they used to be. So the symptoms are the same as the same heart. That's a good question, but male or female, you're going to see the same symptoms. Left side of heart failure is going to be lungs. Right side of heart failure is going to be systemic. But again, they often are intertwined. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right, right side of heart failure. What is this a picture of? JPD. And what causes JPD? 
the good stuff. Someone say right heart failure? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, because right, the blood's supposed to be emptied out of the right heart, but it's not. It's back it up, and you can see that JVD in his neck. Okay, so with the increased pressure from the pulmonary vascular, it causes the right heart to become distended. You guys got that? When the right heart can't effectively enter the fluid, so it backs up into the systemic circulation, and then right, the abdominal organs become Um, abdominal organs become congested and peripheral tissues become edematous. So your right heart failure patients are going to have ascites, they're going to be edematous both in the legs and their belly and their arms and JVD. They look a little bit puffier. Okay. Signs and symptoms of right heart failure. Hepatomegaly. Splenomegaly. Megaly means? Bigger. bigger. Right. It gets bigger. And you literally can palpate it. You can physically feel the liver sometimes in this heart failure patients. Um, dependent pitting edema, uh, venous distension, hydrogen reflux, oliguria. Oh, they have oliguria. What's that? Right. If they're not getting enough blood through their kidneys, they're not going to pee as much. Okay. Um, arrhythmias. Yeah, there's a lot of fluid. That heart's having to work really hard. It's a little irritable. Good. The other thing too, if the right heart usually the right heart issues usually start in the lungs, right? This fluid backs up. If those lungs are stiff, anything that's going to irritate the heart itself, like emphysema, smokers, that um, affects the heart and puts it more at risk for arrhythmias. Just a little side note. Um, elevated CDP with the central venous pressure. That's the measurement you'll get in the ICU. Talk about it later. Um, and again, narrowing pulse pressure. Same thing. The right side of the heart, here's, I'll get you, has a very little difference between the uh, diastolic and the systolic. What's your question? What is hepatogenesis? Um, if you break it down in Latin, the blood, the blood vessel that feeds the liver starts to have reflux because there's too much fluid that it can't handle. Any sense? Any other questions? So would you see like bondage and stuff in a patient like that? You definitely could. Um, that's very severe heart failure, but I have I have seen it. And the patients don't understand. I've never been a drinker my entire life. How come I'm so jaundiced? And you explain heart failure affects every body system. Every body system. And eventually, yeah, they do get jaundice. It's a it is a very sad, uncomfortable way to go going to heart failure. All right, too small sign, I don't think you need to know that. Um, you will often see a murmur or tricuspid insufficiency, which you might hear when you listen to the patient. We talk about the audible S4 and S3, fatigue and weakness, abdominal pain, anorexia. And you say to yourself, well, this patient actually is pretty bloated. They don't look very hungry. But a lot of times these patients are not eating because they have so much fluid, their appetite is much lower. And you have to kind of remind them to get the protein that they need. Their skin is really sick from the back of the fluid. They need they need good caloric intake, even though they don't feel like eating. Um, enlarged right atrium on X-ray, enlarged right ventricle, ascites, and weight gain. All right, this is a great picture of a right side of heart failure patient. She's got the ascites. Look at her ankles, big swollen feet. She looks tired. She looks uncomfortable. This is your right side of heart failure patient. All right. More I think your questions. Hopefully I'll get them right this time. Let's see here. Left-sided heart failure, systolic heart failure, 
failure or left and right side of heart failure. Shortness of breath, we know that. That tells us there's left side heart failure. What else did he have? Fetal edema, which tells us there's right side heart failure. Okay, so A and B are both right. C, we don't know if it's systolic or diastolic unless we do an echocardiogram. We can't know that just from assessment. And then the correct answer is D because it's both left and right heart failure. Any questions about that one? Chest x ray and say, Whoa, you have a big heart. 
and look at all the fluid in the lungs. So if you see fluid in your patient's lungs, then the morning chest x-ray won't be your goal for the day. Let's diarrhea stuff. Yes, thank you. So this is a great picture of chest x-ray to show the difference between a normal heart and heart failure. And a lot of times patients come into the ER never diagnosed with heart failure. We do a quick chest x-ray and we say, whoa, I think you have heart failure. Pretty easy one, right? There's a lot more testing we have to do to figure out the details. Is it <coughs> systolic versus diastolic, left versus right? But chest x-ray is a really good one. Ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is the amount of blood that's ejected during systole compared to diastole. A lot of people think that every bit of blood in the heart is squeezed out every time your heart contracts. That's not true. You actually usually squeeze about 50 to 70% out. So ejection fraction is how much is coming out of the heart. So if it's supposed to be two-thirds of the end diastolic volume, the patient's going to heart failure is less than 40%. So all of us right now are on heart failure. Whenever our heart squeezes, there's only a little bit left, we squeeze it out 50 to 70%. When the patient gets to where it's only 40%, we say, mm, yeah, you have heart failure. And the way they get that percentage number is by echocardiogram. They actually look at the ventricle wall, look at the ventricular wall, measure it at diastole, measure it at systole, and say, okay, that's the percentage you're actually getting out. So why would the heart not be getting out all the blood? Why is more hanging out in there supposed to? Because the heart is squeezing effectively. It's supposed to go like this, and it's just kind of going like this. Okay? All right, diagnostic labs. The beta natriuretic peptide uh, is a number you will very often see. However, it doesn't, it's not like you can say, oh, this patient says 500. Their, their heart failure is a little bad. In this patient's is 2,000, their heart failure is really bad. It kind of is patient dependent, but either way, if it's elevated, you know the patient is in heart failure. Cardiac enzymes is another one, um, just to make sure they're not having ischemia, which we will talk about this afternoon. All right, why are we checking the liver if we're, if we're concerned about the heart? Right, because on the right side of heart failure, fluid backs up on the liver, it can impair the liver's function too. So if you have an elevated BNP of 500, I don't know, 2,000, and you have liver elevation, you know there's some right side of heart failure going on. Um, AVGs will tell you how well the body's oxygenating. We'll do a SED rate, um, which can diagnose early heart failure. And then renal function too. If the patient's not getting enough cardiac output to the kidneys, what would you expect the BU and creatinine to do? Start to increase, exactly. It can't filter as well, so the urea and nitrogen level goes up, but the creatinine goes up. Good. All right, there is um, a better picture of this in your book, but I just wanted to show you guys the different classes of heart failure. <coughs> They're actually delineated pretty vaguely, but in short, if the patient has no limitation of physical activity, they can be along pretty good, but their ejection fraction is a little bit lower. They're class one. Class four is they're not leaving the wheelchair. They are very impaired, very short of breath, needing intervention like a transplant or some other, we'll talk about that in a minute, but these patients are very sick. So they can progress from these stages and they can go back and forth too. Sometimes they'll have an exacerbation. They're acting like stage four. We fix them up, oh, they're, they're, they're better. They're, they're in stage three. It's hard, it's hard to back up though. As the heart progresses, it's not gonna heal. You're not going to like thicken up the ventricle wall if it's all dilated. So it's hard, it's hard to do that. All right, more active questions. Okay. Mr. Johnson was just diagnosed with heart failure and had an ejection fraction of 30%. What's normal? 57. Okay. He is very concerned and asked you. What is heart failure? How did I get it? What would be your best response? A, you just have a binge and take care of yourself. This is what happens. B, heart failure is when your heart fails to beat properly. C, there are multiple causes for heart failure, but the most common is a result of years of high blood pressure putting too much strain on the heart. Or D, you have a weak heart and you'll need to take medication the rest of your life. Oh, good job, everyone.
<laughs> and the thing is, a lot of these are kind of true, actually. I don't know if it'd be the best response on the nurse's part. You just haven't been taking care of yourself. Yeah, you probably haven't been taking this antihypothesis test, or probably haven't been eating very healthy, or you know, heart health is beating properly. It's beating, but not very effectively. I don't know if that's the best description of the patient. Or you have a weak heart, you think that's the rest of your life. Yep, you're going to use inhibitors and diuretics and the drugs for the rest of your life. But that's really not the right response. The patient asks you, how did I get it? And you're answering to them, the high blood pressure put too much time in your heart. Next question. Which of the following would not be an indicator of pulmonary edema? Crack of the lung auscultation, a BNP of 800, wrong diaphragm auscultation, or peak frothy sputum. Which one is not an indicator of pulmonary edema? Thank you. 